Hello everyone, Human Hard Drive here. Today on On a Breadboard, we're going to be talking about this little guy here. And actually, I'm going to be doing a couple videos in this in this series about it. This is probably one of the most common chips used uh, by people learning electronics because it encompasses a lot of very useful things. What this is here is a 555 timer chip. What it does, well, it does a multitude of things, and we're going to be talking about a lot of those things as we put it on a breadboard. Uh, specifically today, we're going to be talking about making this thing operate in a stable operation, essentially making this into a square wave generator where we'll be able to control the frequency. Now, a 555 timer chip, and we'll talk a little more about in detail as to how this works, but I'll say a little now, is it operates by using these two things here, a resistor and a capacitor, which as we know, when you put them in series, creates a time, a small time circuit. So what the 555 does is it's able to use a couple pins to measure the voltage of this and then charge and discharge it. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we look at how this works in this operation. So yeah, for this, you're obviously going to need a 555 timer chip. Uh, capacitor, you're going to need two resistors, so here's one resistor, and for the other one I'm going to be using a uh, potentiometer. Uh, this is a 1K ohm potentiometer. This is a 4.7 kilo ohm resistor and a 2.2 microfarad capacitor. It has to be polarized. Make sure it has this little, my camera would just focus on it. I don't think it is. It has this little strip on one side, and one leg is going to be shorter than the other. You have to make sure it's polarized or it's not going to work properly. Uh, obviously, you're going to need some jumpers. That goes without saying. And a breadboard. And for this, I'm just, you can ignore the Arduino. I'm just using it as a power supply. So yeah, let's go ahead and start wiring this up. Now, the 555 is an 8 dip package, so it's got four pins on one side, four pins on the other. And I'm going to say the pin number and what e each specific pin has a name, so that'll be reference for us later. So the first thing I'm going to do is hook up the power rails on the right hand side. The ground, ground, uh, V and ground, ground, 5 volts. So that this makes the operation of this slightly easier. Bend those slightly out of the way. I'll try and zoom in a bit. Let's see if the, the camera will focus. That seems pretty good. Okay. So, little weird configuration for this. Power is right here. Remember the dot on the chip indicates the front of the chip. Pin 8 is power, so that goes there. Pin 1 is ground, as opposed to pin 4, which is generally how that works. And power is also going to be connected to pin 4, which is the reset. The reset on the 555 is active low, which means if you want to reset the chip, you're going to pull it low. So we need to make sure that it's always on. Now we're going to hook up the first timing resistor, the 4.7, and that's going to go from power to pin 7. Pin 7 is the discharge pin. We'll talk about what that means a little later. Now I'm going to hook up the... seems to have a focusing issue. Let's see if I can get it to focus a little better. That seems a little better. Now I'm going to hook up the potentiometer. We're only going to use two leads of the potentiometer. So I'm just going to put this in here, and then I'm going to take the top lead. Let's see if I can bend this down slightly so you can see. So the top lead here, I'm going to connect that. That's going to be connected from pin 7 to the first lead, and then the middle lead on the potentiometer is going to be connected to pin two and then I'm going to connect one more lead from pin two. Pin two is the trigger pin so I'm going to go from the trigger pin to pin six. This is getting a little crowded. Pin six is the threshold pin and then I'm going to connect the capacitor from, move my finger out of the way there, from pin six to ground. 
And there we go. Remember that the pol the side with the strip is the polarized side, so that goes to ground. So pin six goes to ground, like so. So if I put that a little tricky to see with all the jumpers, but there we go. So what this does is this creates a square wave. And to help visualize that, I'm going to power the Arduino. There we go. Hopefully not move the board too much. Then I'm going to take some leads. I'm going to connect it from pin. Th I'm going to connect one lead to pin three, which is the output pin. And then I'm going to connect the other lead to ground. These are my oscilloscope leads, and I'm going to zoom out ever so slightly. Then I'm going to bring in, move some cables out of the way. I'm going to put that there. Now I'm going to bring in the oscilloscope. There we go. Now the oscilloscope has the ability to measure the frequency, and if I make some quick adjustments, there we go. Okay, and it's not measuring frequency. Let's try reversing this. There we go. That's better. And move the y-axis back down. There we go. Okay. So right here uh, you can see it's sitting at 440 Hertz. That's a middle C or an A4. I can't remember which that is. And if I decrease or if I increase rather the relative resistance of the potentiometer you can see that the frequency goes down and if you remember as you decrease frequency you increase period. So as I increase the resistance of the potentiometer, I'm increasing the time it takes for the capacitor to charge. And if I decrease the resistance, you can see the frequency it climbs back up. And we get to almost 1.4 kilohertz. I think you can see that. So I decrease it, or increase the resistance, frequency goes down. I decrease the resistance, and frequency goes back up. You can also see the duty cycle changing. Uh, this, With the A-stable operation you do not get a fixed duty cycle. That There is another operation where we can control that. But we'll talk about why that is in just a moment. So what you have here is something that can reliably create a, a square wave frequency, or a pulse wave frequency technically, which you can control or if you remove the potentiometer and just gives it give a fixed uh, fixed value resistor you can set the frequency so yeah so let's talk a little more in depth as to how this operation works okay so here I've got the circuit diagram that I just put on the breadboard I got this from the 555 timer sheet uh, 555 timer sheet the 555 timer chip data sheet this is the any 555 data sheet which is slightly different than the LM555 timer data sheet. It has a couple more examples and it does things a little differently. So, the uh, main reason I chose this is because all the pins are labeled, which is quite nice. Okay, so let's talk about how the 555 is able to produce that waveform astably, meaning it's able to do it uh, repeatedly. First I want to talk about the concept of the Schmidt trigger. Now if you haven't seen my video on the Schmidt trigger, I suggest you watch it because that'll make this explanation a little easier and you'll have a little more insight as to how the Schmidt trigger works. But I'll just go ahead and anyway. 555 timer chip can be configured to run as a Schmidt trigger. Remember that a Schmidt trigger, as opposed to a comparator, has two, um, two threshold voltages, an upper threshold and a lower threshold. That's how the 555 works. The upper threshold is the threshold pin and the lower threshold is the trigger pin, which are both tied together and then connected to the capacitor. So they're both measuring the voltage stored in the capacitor. Now this pin here is the discharge pin. This operates in two modes. It operates in high Z and low Z, high impedance and low impedance. Now, as the, let's see if I can keep this in view as I draw this. So the, the voltage in the capacitor is going to 
climb. Now normally the discharge pin is kept in a high impedance state, meaning that current is able to flow from keep scrolling up, from the supply into the capacitor without being drawn by the discharge pin. That's important. So the capacitor is going to continue to charge until it hits the threshold voltage, which is in this case two-thirds VCC. So we had five volts, two-thirds of five volts is ten-thirds. Uh, what does that work out to? should probably have had that calculated out, but it's two-thirds VCC. So what happens when this hits its two-thirds VCC the threshold voltage limit? Well the output ticks on high, and then the discharge pin switches into a low impedance state, a low Z state. What happens is then some current from the capacitor is then drawn into the discharge. The discharge pin is does exactly what that says. It discharges the capacitor. So then what happens? The capacitor starts to discharge until it hits the trigger voltage level, which is one-third VCC. So what happens when it reaches that? The output goes back to low. The discharge pin goes back into a high impedance state. Oop, it's going a little too much. And then it starts to climb again. And then it discharges again. And then it climbs again. And then it discharges again. I'm getting worse and worse as I draw this. Point is, this is how it operates. So it reaches the threshold, discharges until it hits the trigger, and then starts charging back up and forth. And that creates a regular a stable operation which produces that pulse wave. Okay, so the frequency, the output frequency, is calculated by using this formula. Frequency, and this is just an approximation from the data sheet, 1.44 over RA plus 2RB times capacitance. That's the frequency of the oscillation. Now the other thing is the duty cycle, which uh, if you saw, well, not if you saw, when you looked at the oscilloscope output, you saw that as I changed the resistance, the duty cycle changed. And that is calculated by RB over RA plus 2RB. So why is it when I tweak the, this here was the, um, potentiometer. So why is it when I tweak RB the entire duty cycle changes? Well, it's because of this thing here. T equals RC. This is the time constant for an RC circuit. This is the amount of time it takes a, an RC circuit to discharge. The amount of time it takes a capa an RC circuit to discharge, a capacitor to discharge, is less than the amount of time it takes for a capacitor to charge. So that's one reason the duty cycle changes. Or the duty cycle is going to be a little, it's not going to be a perfect 50% duty cycle. The other reason is that when it charges, the, RC, the resistance in the RC circuit is RA plus RB. When it discharges, the only resistance is RB because it doesn't flow back through RA. It just flows from the capacitor through RB to the discharge. So you have unequal resistances. That's another reason the duty cycle is going to change. So if you want a specific duty cycle, you have, there are two unknowns and there are two equations, so you can actually solve for a frequency at a given duty cycle. It just takes a system of equations to solve. So that is why the 555 duty cycle changes as I change the resistance and why it changes frequency. So yeah, that is it for the, so that's how a 555, a stable operation works. So like I said, I wanted, I'm going to do a couple more videos going through a couple more examples from the 555 data sheet and explain how they work in similar detail to this. But until then, I'm Human Hard Drive. Thanks for watching.